Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to New Jersey Performing Arts Center's 22nd annual Kwanzaa celebration. Today is in unique format because we are on a virtual landscape, but nevertheless, we are celebrating Kwanzaa 100%. I'd like to also thank our corporate sponsors who are making it possible for us to continue to celebrate Kwanzaa every single year. And that would be through the generosity of Leon and Toby Cooperman with additional support provided by ADP and Kwanzaa sponsored by the Women at NJPAC, PSEG, Whole Foods Market, and part of the m and Bank Dance Series. We really appreciate all of this corporate support that allows us to continue these important programs. So this is such an amazing day. We had an incredible panel earlier today, acknowledging the elders and their wisdom and their stories and connecting that with today's young people. And now we're going to talk with the Divine Nine about social justice. And we're so pleased and excited to be able to have them with us today. So I'd like to introduce our curator uh, for this panel, and that would be Valencia Yearwood. Valencia Yearwood started her career as a dancer uh, with the Dance Theater of Harlem, and then she's also an actress. She performs on numerous television shows. You probably saw her last week on TV. Um, she is currently um, on the NJ Pax Dance Advisory Committee uh, for the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, um, but she is also a Delta Sigma Theta. So she is one of the Divine Nine. And we are so happy, Valencia, and thank you so much for putting all of this together with coordinating everyone and understanding the vision that we had. And of course, our Director of Community Engagement, Aisha Marable, whose vision is larger than life. So please, we look forward to this discussion. Welcome and thank you. Well, good evening, beautiful people, or good afternoon, beautiful people. Thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful Kwanzaa celebration. And in particular, this panel discussion that is sure to be lively and timely. As Donna said, my name is Valencia Yearwood and I uh, have served on the Dance Advisory Committee at NJPAC for several years. And I am also, as Donna has said, a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And so I was thrilled when two of my most favorite people in the world, Aisha Marable and Donna Walker-Kuhn, asked me to help curate a gathering of representatives from all of the Divine Nine organizations for an important discussion regarding social justice. 2020 has been a historic year on many levels, not the least of which is the realization of the systemic inequities that exist in every aspect of our society. Now, this realization is not new for people of color and certainly not for those of us who belong to these fraternities and sororities because the fight for social justice is built into our DNA. We have literally been fighting this fight for over a century. And during this time, we have even engaged in some friendly competition with each other. But what is so special about 2020 is the renewed commitment for us to work collectively. So I like to say that we're all doing the same work, just wearing different colors and letters while doing so. We stroll to the polls together, we protested together, we comforted each other in our grief and mourning, and we celebrated together when one of our own members of the D9 was elected as the first woman of color to serve as vice president of these United States. The question of the continued relevancy of these fraternities and sororities has been raised in recent years, but I can assure you that we are more relevant than ever before. And today's discussion will bear witness to that. This panel is as diverse as the membership of our beloved organizations. It is intergenerational. It consists of educators, artists, executives, medical professionals, our own county prosecutor, and even the first female president of one of our beloved HBCUs. We stand before you today living out loud and on purpose all seven of the Kwanzaa principles, but in particular, Umoja, which means unity, and Ujima, which means collective responsibility and work. 
So we invite you to please sit back, enjoy the conversation, and enjoy the conversation. And now it is my honor to reintroduce our moderator for today, our moderator for today. If you have been a supporter of the Kwanzaa celebration here at NJPAC over the years, then you already are familiar with him because he has become the father of Kwanzaa here at NJPAC. Abdel Salam is the executive artistic director and co-founder of the Forces of Nature Dance Theater, which was founded in 1981. And he is also the artistic director of the Brooklyn Academy of Music's Dance Africa, which was founded by the late Chuck Davis in 1977 and has become the largest African-American dance, music and art festivals in the United States. Proudly born in Harlem, he is a critically acclaimed choreographer, dancer, teacher, and performing artist, and has worked in over five continents throughout his 50-year career. So clearly, his bio is way too long for me to read to you today. So I encourage you to just Google him. So it is my honor, again, to introduce to some and present to others the incomparable Baba Abdel Salam. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sister Valencia. Um, Asante Sala. Um, and once again, greetings and habari gani, right, to this amazing group of, 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 of beautiful people that I've been honored to come together today and, and, and just have them share the best of who they are. They asked me to speak a, uh, at length about Kwanzaa, but I think in the introductory video, um, some of that has already um, been able to happen. So let me start out by saying that uh, it's important before we start this in the African tradition to again honor our ancestors. And I would like all of my panel members to just simply um, say the name, just one name, you know, of somebody that's important to them. The audience does not have to hear that. And I'm saying this also to our listening audience. Speak and think of someone who is a part of your ancestral tradition, you know, give a, a, a fond thought and simply say, Ashe. So I'm gonna give you about 10 seconds to do that. The screen will be quiet for a second, but I will say my, my mother, Billy Bowser, my father, Milton Bowser, and my grandmother and grandparents who are all in the realm of the ancestors. I love you, I remember you. Asheu. Okay. It's also important to once again remind us that everything that happens in our world happens because of divine light. Not only do we have the divine nine, but we were blessed in 1966 to have that divine light come through the person of Dr. Maulana Karenga, who brought us the gift of Kwanzaa and the Nguzo Saba. And this is why we're celebrating, you know, that energy and that information and that passion and that light and how it has brought the wisdom and the culture of people of Africa and its diaspora into the presence of our daily lives. And we celebrate that every year from December 26 to January 1st. But what I did not say in the opening introductory video was that in addition to celebrating this principle during a holiday, right? It is also important for us to remember that the principles of unity, self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, having a purpose in one's life, having creativity, and faith not only in God and faith in a, in a religious or spiritual system, but faith in ourselves that we have the ability to do whatever we need to do in order to bring our divine family together, bring the best of who we are as a people and as a culture to respect our African and our ancestral, ancestral heritage and bring that forth in today's society to always push the wisdom forward, to maintain and honor tradition but at the same time we honor tradition, we know that life is organic and Africa and its civilization and, and the diaspora and those of us here in the Americas are a dynamic people. So wisdom and light and culture is dynamic. It has a tradition, but it is constantly morphing, constantly changing and constantly becoming. And on that note, you know, I want to introduce our first two speakers, brother, Justin Antonot from the Phi Beta Sigma fraternity, and also Sister Yoshi Donato of the Zay Phi Beta sorority. They are getting ready to come to you, you know, 
virtually and bring you the wisdom, the light, and the empowerment of their fraternities and their vision about how we make our society better as a people. Thank you so much. Uh, and also, I just want to start by saying thank you to uh, the NJ Pack as well as Ms. Valencia Yearwood for assembling this fantastic team of these really effective members of the Divine Nine. I am humbly honored to be here on behalf of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, the Iota Chi Sigma chapter, affectionately known as the Sigmas at the Jersey Shore. Um, I'm also honored to be sitting here on this call with uh, my soror and friend and colleague, uh, Ms. Yoshi Donato of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. She'll give her own uh, interesting uh, past as well as her path here to the Divine Nine. Uh, as you'll see, the other members are beginning to populate. And so welcome to you all as well. And me and Yoshi are gonna just start off this, this fantastic conversation by talking about something that has affected all of us in one way or another, and that's education. Um, education and not only the, the, the way that it's in, in a state now, but we wanna begin to talk about how we can move from dealing with our students to working with the policy and then putting it into practice. So again, I know that there's a bunch of different uh, topics that we're gonna be speaking about tonight. Uh, me and Yoshi have the honor and the privilege of being able to begin this conversation. So I hope that this springboard leads to some really good conversation for the remaining uh, remainder of this hour. So in regard to education, let, let me just say first, um, thank you to the students who've been through this ordeal. I, 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 we cannot express enough how, how much we, we we support you and we love you. So thank you for being able to go through this time together with us. Also a huge thank you to the educators on the call, in the room, in your lives. Uh, you guys have been through, we have been through an ordeal, but more importantly, we've been through a time where we've had to relearn our entire craft. Um, and with that being said, I know that Yoshi's going to begin talking about something specifically because again, we have a lot to talk about in a very little bit of time. Um, so Soro, if you're, if you're willing to go ahead and begin this process, I'll open up the conversation and welcome you all. Well, thank you, um, <clears throat> uh, Justin. My name is Yoshi Donato. I am uh, currently uh, in my 20th year as an educator uh, in a suburban high school here in New Jersey. I'm proud member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. And uh, in 2017, I retired as a master sergeant from the United States Army. So all of those experiences I bring to the table in terms of uh, being flexible <laughs> um, and uh, hunting the good stuff, even in, in, in turbulent times. One of the things that I've noticed uh, is that uh, in the, the environment of uh, this pandemic, we have exposed a lot of inequity in education. Uh, when it uh, as it pertains to technology, as it pertains to uh, social emotional well being uh, and instruction, uh, I really thought it was important for Justin and I to pair up because whereas I uh, have my uh, roots for the last eighteen years in suburban education, Justin works in urban education, and we saw those two uh, demographics come together like you know, uh, you talk about food insecurity, you know, there are some buzzwords going around about that type of thing. What is food insecurity? That meant like there were young people because of the pandemic, parents lost their jobs, that we had to figure out how to feed them. That was no different in the suburbs as we learned. Uh, parents who were not technically savvy had to align with the school district to make sure that there, there were not further gaps in education. And that happened in the suburbs too. Uh, uh, COVID-19 was a rude awakening for everyone. Justin, I think you hit it on the head when this was new learning for all of us, for the home front and the school front. And uh, what I believe now is that uh, America sees uh, teachers as rock stars. Uh, it's a different light for us now. Um, I, I feel, I never felt more supported uh, than this climate, unfortunate climate. Um, I think our students will be better for and our teachers because they had to find a new way uh, to get to our learners. And what we definitely learned is that everyone learns the same. This exposed that. These inequities expose that. And what we're constantly trying to bridge a gap as it is. Um, so I think going forward, I think there's a lot to say about the traditional brick and mortar schoolhouse. And we have to take the lead in terms of that. And that's why I'm really proud. One, you know, one of our tenants is, uh, in Zeta is scholarship. So we have to constantly look and how we're going to get that to our kids, to our families, so that the gap 
the achievement gap isn't broadened uh, as we go forth uh, past this uh, epi uh, pandemic and beyond. Absolutely. And Yoshi, if I could really quickly, sure. just, um, a couple of the other members would like to go ahead and chime in on this specifically. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you for mentioning the fact that we do come from two completely different sets of school districts, right? Uh, working in an urban environment uh, has been disproportionately uh, interesting, <laughs> to say the least. A lot of our educators are in spaces where not only do they, do they not live in the environments, but they understand that now they have to look at some of the real issues that have always plagued the students in their classrooms. Um, and with that being said, I think that is something that we have to mention that you know, our instructors and our teachers and paras and principals and everyone who has all these different uh, capacities, whether they go, come from K through 12 or into the higher ed space, I think it's something that now we have to address wholeheartedly and working in understanding that even with the buildings, right, our buildings are not supportive uh, for our students in regard to just the physical location, right? We, how do we have a classroom of student 23, 24, 25 students on some small cases um, being able to socially distance safely in these classrooms? It's brought up a bunch of different conversations and I know that we're using this as a springboard, so uh, thank you for letting us speak sp openly and honestly first about this conversation as I I believe that education is one of the biggest things that will help us continue to be unified as a community. So thank you. This is Michael Straker. I'm a, a member of my alumni chapter of Cap Alpha Psi. Um, I'm a medical doctor and, and you know just as in education we've seen uh, a big switch and change uh, and I know Walter also works in the, in the medical field as well. I mean we have seen a, a, a real change in how um, medicine is delivered and how um, we are really under a, a real big microscope on how things, especially with this new vaccine coming out, how vaccines are, are created, how vaccines are distributed. You know, what we've seen during COVID, and, and I've said this before, many people either who are watching or on the panel, I say it every day, COVID has changed everything. So wh whether it's, you know, the delivery of, of education, as we've seen, I mean, I have two kids who are, are whose classroom is, is their, now their bedroom, you know, and, and their, their you know, recess, which is no, no longer there, is, is, you know, just walking outside. You know, even in medicine, we've had to, you know, kind of really uh, figure out how to, how to deliver uh, medical care differently, whether it's now through virtual visits, whether it's uh, um, you know, really spacing out how we, how we see our, I, I don't know how many people have been to, been to the doctor's office, but if you've been to a doctor's office now, how many people are in a waiting room? Like almost none in my office is, is done. I'm an OBGYN, I practice in Nutley. So I have a very diverse pop, uh, patient population, but we are, we are doing everything differently. So I don't, I don't know if this really, we wanna springboard this into a COVID conversation, but I think COVID has really you know, kind of brought to light a lot of, of the social injustices that are out, are out there. When we talk about, like Yoshi said, f food insecurity, um, you know, health, healthcare, um, uh, yeah. healthcare disparities and it's really become an interesting time and, and I think this is the springboard here again we're all Greeks in in terms of our our our, our um, fraternities and sororities but we're, we're 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 African in descent and we have to really you know use this as a springboard to you know kind of figure out how we're going to close those gaps honestly you know Dr. Stryker it's really funny um if you study art and you study the blending of colors and you take blue and red, you get purple, which is a great segue to the comments I want to make next. Uh, my name is Walter Douglas, as you've heard. I am a member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, and I also serve as Chief Operating Officer at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. And why that's important is what you've heard so far is a conversation about education, and it's segued into a conversation about healthcare. And so for me and what I do in my day-to-day -day living, I see the intersection of both. And so when we've talked about inequities, yes, there's absolutely inequity in our educational system, as well as inequities in our healthcare system. And if you think about where I work and how we provide services, those inequities really became magnified in this era of COVID. Not only in understanding how we educate and train our future healthcare providers and how we in the professional health sciences had to pivot in order to provide the best training and education for your future healthcare providers and caregivers, but how we could provide care for patients who traditionally have been underserved or underrepresented in the system. When we think about healthcare and health and well being, we think about some of the history of how Black and Brown people and women have been treated in the sciences. And we've had to deal with 
re-educating or educating the public on those sensitivities, also helping the public to understand that given people like Dr. Stryker, myself and many others, especially in the Divine Nine, like Dr. Ernest Everett Just, one of our founders, or Dr. Charles Drew, who helped pioneer in health sciences, we now have men and women of color who are leading the innovation and discovery to make sure that we are well represented in the, uh, the solutions, the, the cures, the treatment modalities that are so important for our very vulnerable and our very loving communities to overcome COVID. And so I think that as we continue through our conversation today, we have to remember that our work is not just isolated in education, healthcare, all these things do intersect. And I think you'll hear that throughout our conversation this afternoon. That reminds me, the discussion we're having about inequity can of course go across every discipline that we have experienced. But um, first, I guess I'm surely, I shouldn't say I guess, I'm surely Lewis Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Omicron Xi Omega chapter and a representative of historically black colleges as many of us are and many people in the world are. But when you said inequity and when you said achievement in education, you rang the historically black college and universities, the HBCU bell for me, since that is you know, where most of my work has been done. And the thing about it is from the very beginning, those institutions have been catalysts for achievement. First, because you had to go there. And secondly, because if you know about it, you wanna go there, right? or that has been the story. Yet, with a record of achievement, look at everybody in the Divine Nine, how many people have come from historically black institutions and gone forth and served across all of our lines, all of our numbers, all of our col colors. At the same time, even today, recognizing that we are dealing with disparity. You know that our colleges were founded on um, some cases by individuals like Mary McLeod Bethune and Bethune Cookman and Dr. Shepherd at North Carolina Central. In other cases, they were formed by organizations mainly in the churches like the Methodist Church, which considered itself helping the newly freed people, I mean, non people of African descent, viewing themselves as helping people of African descent from a particular perspective. And the perspectives were different. I, I don't mean to disparage anybody, but on the one hand, it was to keep people in the fold, so to speak, keep them doing something under observation, so to speak. And on the other hand, it was an opportunity to free yourself. Given those two somewhat conflicting um, points of view, we have entered even into this particular point in time with a very different view of fiscal allocation, even in the government, you, or maybe mostly in the government. You know for a fact that after the first HBCU started, there was a land grant governmental decision to allow all states to have institutions funded by the state. And right after that, there was a move movement to keep blacks out. So a second rule was made, yes, the blacks can come, but they have to be specifically doing something agricultural, mechanical, or the phrase normal. I don't really know what normal was supposed to mean. But in any case, even then, there was a disparity. And in spite of that, look around the room, look at your parents, look at your relatives, what has happened. I wouldn't be, have been a president of a historically black college if I hadn't had a mother who did not go to college, who was not supported, who supported herself and looked after her daughter on the one hand, and a father who did go to West Virginia State University and who taught me to read before I went to school because the other kids on my neighborhood could read. I simply didn't want to be left out. He simply handed me a ticket. You want to read like them? Sit down, let's read. I'm saying that from a kujalistic point of view, kuja chagalistically point of view, we have to liberate ourselves as most of us are doing, or we wouldn't be here celebrating Kwanzaa now. And thank you, Brother Abdel, so much for your leadership. But we have to also work that in the schools from elementary to college. We have to do whatever else, no matter what's happening in the institution, we know what's happening. We have to liberate our kids, make sure the curriculum in school doesn't conflict with some historical or cultural perspective. We have to know our own history and we have to teach it. And I think we support those historically black colleges, whether we graduated from them or not, we have to make sure they stay and are supported. You know, you allowed me to get on my, my uh, 
bookcase and say what I wanted to say. <laughs> and you know, we could say something else, I'm coming back again. But the point uh, is, we have to support those colleges with our, imagine there are more than two or three million of us. If we take our nine, you're millions of us. Imagine if we all gave a little bit of money to HBCUs. I mean, it would just be amazing. Say it was a hundred dollars. Imagine if all the millions of us did that. But whether we're doing it about HBCUs or whether we're doing it about something we're interested in in our community, we have to support intellectually and financially from a spiritual, and when I say spiritual, I mean the spirit of knowing who we are. Who we I are. go, I go, yeah. thank, you, thank you so much, uh, Sister. Sorry, okay, okay. Right. Um, uh, we're gonna, we're going to, um, I was told not to bounce past, but to throw a high, you know, a, a, a high lob so somebody can um, catch it and, and give us a slam <laughs> dunk. And I believe that does brother, um, was it brother Theodore that asked me to do that? You know? No, but I can catch the pass. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, thank you very much, Baba. And thank you everybody for your comments. Uh, we couldn't have gotten started, I think, in a better way. My name is Ted Stevens and I have the honor and um, several honors in my life, one of which is I'm currently the prosecutor here in Essex County, New Jersey, which is the largest and busiest prosecutor's office in the state of New Jersey. And I'm also a past international Grand Polaris of Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated, which was the entity which helped convert the Elite Eight to the Divine Nine that we're all <laughs> celebrating here today. So um, on, uh, on this panel, especially, I just, um, I'm very, very honored to be part of it. I wanna thank also Justin and Yoshi because I think they really kind of capsulize some of the, the big issues that we're all dealing with today. Certainly the educational issues, which have been talked about and we could go on ad nauseum since every one of our organizations stresses scholarship, uh, certainly um, among everything else but also uh, talking about the food insecurities that do exist. And fortunately, I'm, I'm sure that many people on this call do not suffer from that, but it is real. And so uh, you just have to look around and see that there are people who are suffering who have not suffered as much before this pandemic. So Iota Phi Theta and also the Essex County Prosecutor's mm. Office has recognized that some uh, nine, 10 months ago, and so we have been a partner with the East Orange Senior Center and have uh, engaged in food distribution for during that entire, uh, the entirety of that time. First, it was every Saturday and then it's been switched to every Friday, a little bit more challenging, but we pulled it off. And we do so inviting other organizations. Uh, Cap Alpha Psi has showed up uh, and uh, Omega Psi Phi. We all collectively uh, give food out. And, and I'm happy to report that we've given out about a half a million boxes of food to the residents and in the East Orange area. Uh, through the help of Jody Cooperman and her organization. And I think we're, we're really addressing a problem and, and also we're there as a resource for people to know we're there on, on a very regular regular basis. Um, Iota Phi Theta was formed in, in 1963 in the crucible of the civil rights movement. And so I think we've always tried to find needs that are contemporary needs and deal with them forthrightly. And so um, I'm happy to report that uh, we're extremely pleased to have been of service as we move forward. And, and hopefully we do see a light at the end of the tunnel. I, I defer to Doc and, and all those in the medical profession. Uh, and we've got to do a great job to also convince the, our populace, the African-American community particularly, that that really is a vaccine worth taking. And I think that probably all of our organizations have to embark on robust education um, programs because we have to convince our folks that that light at the end of the tunnel is really a way out and not a train. So uh, we're gonna have to make sure that we definitely move them in the right direction. 100%, and I think in, in terms of that, I, I wanna say two things, one is that um, but the food that's being distributed in the East Orange is not just, you know, uh, little, little boxes of, 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 of pasta and cereal. They're giving out real, real significant amounts of food to people who really need them. And I'm talking, you know, it's, in some instances, fresh produce, you know, fresh, fresh, you know, meat. It's, it's, so it's not just, you know, the things that you kind of think about when, when you when you pull out a can of, of beans and you donate it to the food pantry. They, they are really doing a significant job. 
and uh, some of our brothers have had an opportunity to to um, to uh, volunteer over the last couple of weeks, you know, and 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 I volunteered way in the summer, so it it has been going on, and it's more than just those one or two days. And during the summer, it was it was probably three or four days out of the week, and the lines are significant. It is not just two or three people; they are again half of so it's a half a, a half a million, you know, boxes of food. That that's a significant need there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, I think as, as a community, we, we have shown that that unity and that, you know, that that spirit of, uh, of, of Umoja in that respect. And we need to continue that even when the pandemic is done. And I think, like you said, Ted, the, the, um, the need for our community, especially to to know that the vaccine is here and the vaccine is important and the, the vaccine is not equivalent to what happened at, at Tuskegee. Right. Is, is key. Um, please, I'm, I'm, I'm scheduled to get my vaccine on Monday, you know, uh, so I think it's important for, for folks to know that, that the, te- the technology that was used to develop the vaccine is not new technology. It wasn't done at warp speed in, in a, in, 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 in forgetting about safety. You know, we, it, it has been done safely. The, the, the technology that, that to, to, to develop the, the vaccine has been around for about six years. There was a sister who was who was spearheading that technology and spearheading that research. Um, uh, if, if, and I want to say her name correctly, Doctor uh, Kismika. Uh, and let me and, and and her name just just flew out of my head real quick, but I'll, I'm gonna get it. Um, she works at NIH, and, and I'm Clemens. I believe the last name is. And, and bear with me. I'm sorry, um, Corbett. I'm sorry, Corbett. 34 year old sister. Who is spearheading that that research and on every every level of the even on the on, from the FDA um, on for the those panels that, that are looking at um, the um, emergency youth author, authorization the the president of Meharry Medical College is on that panel so we have that representation in, at every level on developing this vaccine so it's very important for for our people especially who have who have the who have history. In, in terms of the, the medical injustice, know that you know things are different now and, and have been improved to to a point where we can I, I think trust trust the science and not necessarily you know be, be fearful of the history. I go. Yeah. I, just, I just want to give a fifteen second commercial uh, for <laughs> Rutgers University. Uh, if you look at the work that's been done at the New Jersey Medical School here in Newark and Essex County, what's being done there at Robert Johnson Medical School down in Brunswick, Middlesex County. Uh, but to understand that we've also set up uh, some of the first uh, vaccine centers here in our communities, uh, we are available to answer questions for the community. Uh, Dr. Chris Purnell, one of my colleagues at University Hospital, has done a phenomenal job, not just as a physician and public health advocate, but she herself personally participated in the clinical trials, as well as Dr. Valerie Fitzhugh, two, two sisters. Uh, who really not only did it as scientists and physicians, but as people who are willing to put their lives on the line because they believe in this science for us, for our community. So we are available uh, for more education, for sharing, so reach out to us and we can talk more about that. Uh, but other, there's some of our other esteemed panelists who've not had a chance to speak yet and really want to bounce the ball around and give them all the chance to jump in, especially uh, Brother Wilbur Davis and Sister Dana Hassell as well. So thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Will Davis, a uh, proud member of Alpha Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. I um, came through the Zai Sai chapter, Fall 17, and I'm a current member of Alpha Alpha Lambda. I would first like to thank the organizers of NJ PAC for putting together this much needed program. I would also like to thank my brothers, Freddie Davis and brother Aaron Jones for choosing me to represent Alpha Alpha Lambda chapter of Alpha Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. It is an honor to be on the panel with my fellow D9 members. Thank you, and thank you to all the people that are virtually in attendance today. Right now, the Black community is in the midst of three pandemics, and we already hit on one, COVID-19, economic injustice, and violence against Black bodies. These pandemics are causing our children to fall even further behind in basic subjects like math and English because the government and the educational system have failed to address the many disparities that our communities face. As members of the Divine Nine, we must, and today's topic is on unity, we must unite 
to make sure we are advocating for real educational reform. We must stop acting like symbolic victories when companies write diversity and inclusion statements or hire one of us to become their next diversity and inclusion officer is a huge advancement for our people. One of my fraternity brothers, Sean Rochester, lays out the data in his book, The Black Tax, that shows us that there is indeed a cost for being black in America. <laughs> as we talk about unity today, the D9 and the black community as a whole will have no other choice but to address one of the three pandemics head on, and it's a hard one, economic injustice. As Dr. King said, who was a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, we can no longer be silent about the things that matter. Dr. King in his I Have a Dream speech in 1963 said, we cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and the Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. Almost 60 yeah. years later, we see now new voting right restrictions that turn purple states to red, new barriers to voter access, and lack of voter options that make a lot of our people believe there is nothing for which to vote for. The D9 must unite to make sure our people are represented because like one of Alpha's national programs say, a voteless people is a hopeless people. I look forward throughout the, today's panel discussion to have a productive dialogue, or how, which we already have having so far, on how to unite on issues affecting our people. And with that, I'll turn it over um, Dana ha um, Hassel, sorry, Dana Hassel, who I, I believe is the last one to, to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much and greetings to everyone today. Um, I'm very proud to be uh, asked to participate in the panel this afternoon. So uh, I want to um, also tell you a little bit about me. I am a proud member of uh, Sigma Gap Rose Sorority, uh, a founding member of the Theta New chapter at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, we just celebrated our 40th anniversary. Uh, with that, I've also been uh, a member of higher education for uh, a number of years uh, in the area, primarily academic advisement, but also admissions, financial aid. And so I get a ch chance to deal with the students firsthand and what they need and where we are bridging the gap. And one of the things that I do like to do is try to find some kind of positive in everything. And uh, one of my friends sent to me, and I can't take credit for this, said, we are not uh, all in the same boat. We're all in the same storm. Some of us have canoes, some of us have yachts. Mm -hmm. Those are drowning. And so be kind and help wherever you can. And so with that, I do want to take the uh, uh, moment to talk about how we can assist our students in the middle of this pandemic as they're moving forward. Um, a little bright light that I try to uh, envision for them is, you know, where are our colleges and universities? I am the representative for the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, for the state of uh, New Jersey for the admissions office. So uh, looking at this as an opportunity for those students who have worked very hard academically all through their educational career, but they don't test well. Find those institutions who are offering test optional admission because you get a chance to showcase your academic uh, success it's more important what you did for four years as opposed to what you do for four hours or so on, on a Saturday afternoon. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you have things going on at home. But find those institutions who are going to approach a holistic review in looking at you as a person you uh, and what you have accomplished in those four years and reach out to them. Admissions counselors are just people too. And we just want to make sure that everybody is taking advantage where they can of these breaks and putting yourself forward in a time like this and finding those institutions that are really speaking to you as an individual and not just a number. And so um, in 
some of my cases where I do see uh, an, a rival institution can offer something to better assist that particular student, share the wealth. And I think we have, uh, as uh, Divine Nine, have done that with each other at all times, especially across the educational community. And so finding those bright lights um, where we can assist during this pandemic uh, to help students, I think will really uh, be very important in the long run in moving forward. Sister Dane, I want to want to take this a second. Thank you so much for everybody for their initial contribution. But but believe it or not, we're just getting started. We've got about another fifteen minutes left, okay. and I want to use it just to dig into something that I think is an important uh, 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 centering thought that everybody spoke about. Like, certainly, education is empowerment, right? And that is a major yeah. thrust in terms of whatever it is that's being done in this moment, in this present moment, by by everything that you're saying. Um, one of the Greek definitions of the origin of the word, right, is educare, right? When you talk about education, which is not simply to take something from without and, and, and put it in the minds of young people, but to look at a person and help them discover the best of the light that exists within themselves. It is what the, the universe that exists within all of us is something that all of you have done. When I listen to Sister Shirley, she is an example I should say Mama Shirley, right? Because Mama told us in, in the pre-discussion that I am the elder. And so Mama Shirley, I submit to the wisdom of a woman and the wisdom of Mama Shirley. But, but Mama Shirley is an example of Kuji Chakalia, you know, for her to come from a family that, 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 that where she said her mother was not blessed with the gift of light and mind through education and for to have that desire within herself to bring that forth and to come forth and do what she's done is a, is, is a manifestation of what the Nguzo Saba and Kwanzaa is about. Thank Brother you. Will, you know, held up the book. You saw he was holding up the book. <laughs> so he got right into Ujamaa, right? He was pushing his man's book, you know, and saying, listen, I'm, I'm going to talk about education and what we need to do to empower students. But at the same time, we have to spend our money with <laughs> ourselves. We have to take our resources and the dollars that we earn in the society and turn those resources around in order to continue to empower us. So I wanna use this as a bridge because we've got some topics that you talked about um, in some of the pre-discussion, and I'm gonna do what Dr. Karenga does. Dr. Karenga one time on the Apollo stage, everybody was speaking extemporaneously. And he said, I know I write books and, every, and everything and I can speak very well off the cuff, but let me look at my notes, right? <laughs> and so he looked at his notes for one second and then he took the conversation into an amazing position. Um, uh, we talked about one of the things you said you wanted to speak about was either black entrepreneurship, um, microaggressions in the workplace, right. Right, and collaboration against women, black LG LGBTQ and identity and trans lives. How do we protect them? Reparations, post-traumatic slave disorder. <laughs> I mean, you brought up a lot of things, right, in the pre-discussions. I want you to take a minute and take any one of those things as we have this final maybe 10-minute round robin. Just keep, you know, bounce off of each other. Um, uh, uh, Malcolm used to teach um, uh, Brother El Haj Malik Al Shabazz. We all of us know him as Malcolm most of the time. He used to deliver something called a kutba, which was a lecture. But kut in the comedic language means light and ba, which is breath, right? So he would, he would get with us and give us the breath of light. So this is what you're doing. Take these subjects that you want to talk about and continue to breathe that light into our community and the people who are listening right now. Reparations, post-traumatic slave divorce, microaggressions. Will you, you take it, family? Take it, divine nine. Take it, divine nine. Well, let me jump in right here because because I, I like this, and I'm going to approach all the topics from a very high-level view. And I think one of the things that we should all recognize is that we cannot overcome, conquer, improve upon any of the things that you've listed if we don't do it through collective resources and community and coming together. Mm -hmm. But I think if we begin there and understand the value in being part of a community, being part of a structure that gives support to our weakest and our most vulnerable, then we can overcome. I like what Sister Dana said earlier when she quoted, she says, you know, we're all in the same storm, you know? Mm -hmm. and I think if we can have an appreciation for that comment and that perspective, it allows us all not just to be competitive for competitive sake, 
but competitive in the, in the fourth cardinal principle of Omega, and uplift, where we uplift one another and we improve one another and we improve our communities. And so I think as we begin to dissect these topics, remember that everything begins with unity. If I could jump in, uh, I also think that at this point, uh, it's this is why it's so important to talk about service and exactly how emergent it is for us to really use the platforms that our fraternities and sororities were created for. And again, to listen to to, to quote Miss um, Miss Hassel, we are in the same storm. But in the Divine Nine's uh, perspective, we've been in the same storm. And I think that, and to to Brother Davis's point. It's time for us to, we have these three pandemics and epidemics that we're working against, but I think it's the, our, our fraternities and sororities demand that we address all three of them, right? And I think that with nine of us or, and having these organizations to be able to divide and conquer while also at the same time being unified in these, in these conversations and topics, it's time for us to really break this down. As most of you know, um, first of all, again, and, and when talking about that service aspect, you know, again, the work that we do in Asbury Park School District specifically during the, during the, the, the COVID and exactly when it began to, to happen, our students already had food insecurity. They already had these things that, you know, COVID kind of completely just disseminated for them. Um, and when we continue to push to have this food uh, given to them, and like you said, these aren't small boxes, right? These aren't little lunch, but these are major family contributions. And I think that mm -hmm. what's happening now is not only are we giving this to them on a broadened and, and more consistent basis, but what's happening is families don't feel ashamed anymore to come and ask for free food. That's right. Um, something that we've had to deal with in, in uh, not only in our school district but uh, school districts across the board whether or not they whether or not they're urban or suburban people have that that pride of no 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 I don't want people to see me struggle but everyone's struggling so at this point it's time for us to use our service organizations to continue to push the message of not only unifying ourselves about our missions but making sure that we're unifying our families and our communities about being helped mm -hmm. I love the fact that we got rid of oh, I'm sorry I'm sorry no bro. I'm um, thank you. Uh, thank you, sister. No, I defer to the sister. Please go right ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say I love the fact, especially in my suburban high school, when one of the top in the state, that we got rid of the lunch forms. The lunch forms, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, when the parents from the Fortune 500 companies lost their jobs, I see them coming to the school to get these boxes. I, I, I and I'm cheering because that you're absolutely right. We no longer have the shame about getting free food because people need to eat, and it doesn't matter what you made. It's like, come get this food. We get it, you know. And, and you know how much food goes to waste in public school systems. Mm -hmm. It is amazing. The public should be outraged. Mm -hmm. it, they should be outraged. And so I'm, I'm ever so. It, and it's unfortunate. It took a, a pandemic to level the have and have nots in our country. And 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 we have to lead that conversation. We have to encourage families. Go get that food. <laughs> go get that computer. We can have one-on-one -on -one devices because guess what? The school has them. We don't have we don't have to hold them back and say, oh no, 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 you can't take them from the schoolhouse. Now they're saying come get them. And we need to make sure we're having those conversations so our community knows. So access is possible, but we need to lead those conversations consistently. You know what's fascinating you. is that everybody's speaking, everybody's becoming more passionate. Did you see that the <laughs> passion coming out of, out of Yoshi and, and Brother Ted? Um, and I love how That's this Master is, Sergeant there. <laughs> I love it. And I love how this is veggie back. In my circle, we say veggie back rather than piggyback, right? I love how this <laughs> is veggie backing, you know, back and forth to one another. Um uh, I know um, um um brother Ted, you were gonna say something that you deferred to um to Sister Yoshi. Yes, brother Slama, thank you. Uh, the one thing I did want to say and just uh, and the food insecurity piece has been so huge. I talked about that earlier, and I want to thank Brother Justin for really working with us on that as well. But the, what, they're, what he does and what the other educators do, I think, is maybe the most important part moving forward, because we're going to come out of this pandemic eventually, God willing. But also, from an educational standpoint, dealing with young folks, under getting, giving them the gift of understanding that knowledge is so important at an early age. And, and point in fact, I mean, we've all gone to college and, and um, I, I'm, so, I'm so happy to deal with educated individuals, especially those in the sciences. And they came up with a term called microaggression. I know what was microaggression. All right, and, and that's just being in an environment where someone tries to put you down to the point where it, it uh, takes away from your opportunity to get your education. We've all dealt with that. 
And there are all kinds of ways that people, um, um, science puts in way how they're going to train the organizations to deal with that. But to me, and I grew up, I went to public high school. I went to East Orange High School in the day when that was the only high school, if you had a choice you'd want to go to is East Orange High School. And those of us that came out of there came with a real sense of who we were as a person, a great history, uh, in terms of the, the great black culture that we come from. And having that sense of worth, I think is the number one thing we need to give our young folks so that when they do go in those other environments where they may be faced with a negative situation, they're able to back that off and say, no, no, I know my self worth. I know my history. Mm -hmm. And so having that in ourselves just innate is probably our best defense. And we all can participate that through um, the IOTA Youth Alliance, through the Sigma, Sigma Beta Club, et cetera, where we do take it upon ourselves to reach out for these young folks and to really give them the, sub, the, the sustenance they need, the substance they need to be successful as they go on in their later life. I, I love that. Uh, and you remind me so much of the great opportunity we, the Divine Nine, have to transmit that to the young people by just being who we are and recognizing and uplifting our collective power, not playing any games about mine is so much better than another one. We can demonstrate by who we are. We're college people. We're professional people. We have service activities, that's all part of our commitments, to do so with a strong push, recognizing that we have to uplift our people, our kids, by our example. So we need to set it, I think we are, but to work very hard to set it as a collective power. Yes, amen. I agree. Amen, to, amen to that. If I, can I bring that back real quick um, to the conversation about reparations? And it's a difficult, tough, I mean, obviously a a tough conversation to have because when when we look at it, it's a, normally emotionally attached, which is why I recommend it. I'll put it back up again one more time, <laughs> the black tax, but it, it is data driven. And one thing that you can do, you can deny people's opinions, but you can't deny the data, that right? Is. And that is an important aspect why I love the book so much and why I love um, Brother Sean Rochester. One thing he did a recent study on for example, and have this conversation on Black Wall, Wall Street. And most often people put a dollar amount to what, what were the files claimed or how much they think the town would be worth today, but they don't talk about and they don't put the price point on also how much business was lost there, how, much, how many um, people that, were, that lost their homes, that lost their businesses, where the children are now, if, if you look at the history of Black Wall Street, a lot of, after the bombings, after the, the absolute massacre that, uh, that occurred there, they were transported into concentration camps. So we're not, so putting just a simple 10 million, some people say, on that is not actually appropriate. We have to also look at how the multiplier effect um, it, what is there and it, it will end up being um, millions of dollars that is owed just in that particular location. Now, when we take it all the way back to, to slavery time and then we take it to the civil rights era and then now we take it to today where you see a disparity in all aspects in, in loans and going to, and we have a couple of medical people here, but going to the doctor and seeing how we die at the hands of white doctors, 10%, Black women died at the hands of when when doing when um during childbirth died at the hands of white doctors ten times more than they do with non doctors. All of this is again the cost of being black. And I just real quickly I want to go into the educational portion of this, and I love what um Yoshi Justin um Dr. Dr. Lewis was saying on on, on this part. We have being a young person myself. I know the importance right now of the people in my life instilling me that I'm, yeah. I'm going with somewhere. I'm going to be something in life. 100%. Not just restricting us to, you know, the sports or, or, or a life of whatever it may be, but there's a limited possibilities for your life. And right now I see I'm working with a child, uh, a, a student in seventh grade, and I can see 
when there's an absence of that in his life, wh- how that's a negative effect on everything that he does. Right now, not submitting homework. Right now, he's not attending classes. And that's because people are not instilling in him that he can go somewhere. He wants to be a basketball uh, NBA player or a football player. There's nothing wrong with that. He could definitely make it to NBA or NFL, but you also, to be one of the greatest players of all time, like a LeBron James, like a Michael Jordan, you need other um, life skills as well, not just dribbling the basketball. So that's what we're trying to instill in him right now. And now, now that there's a couple people, mentors in his life that are, that are there, he's starting to see, okay, why is it important to go to class? Why is it important to submit their homework? And it, it didn't, and I, I know, understand that educators, they have limited resources and they're not being paid fairly at this moment. That's where the D9 definitely needs to step in at this moment. First advocate for increasing pay among educators, having educators that are actually willing to work with each child and not just take this w- one step approach, um, leave no child behind type approach and not personalize it to each individual and actively, you know, and go into them and not, and I'm, I'm trying not to ramble here, but my, my last point about this and it's a sit, and I heard some people talk about the technology limitations, not just take what government, what educators are saying. Um, um, one thing that um, Alan Wright, brother Alan Wright and um, I, uh, brother Mac, I was on the call with, middle schoolers, he asked the students, what are, do you guys have the proper technology to attend class? And a lot of them said they have, I mean, old Chromebooks they, they, that hardly work, right? And their Wi-Fi is very spicy. So sometimes they get kicked out of class. Sometimes there's limitations and trying to hear what the teachers is, um, are talking about during class. This is why we are currently behind. We're even further behind, like I said, earlier in ma- basic things like math and English. And we have to address those things. If- I just need to jump in right here. I just want to jump in right here because I haven't said a lot because I opened up the program and I'm probably going to close it. Um, I am just so thrilled that we are here. Just that we are here. Um, this is exactly what it is that we needed to do Um, I am bursting with pride right now because Brother Will Davis is actually the son of my line sister. So (laughs) I I had to throw that in. I had to throw that in. I had to throw that in. Um, But this this is exactly the kind of conversation that we need to have. And one of the things that I want to just throw out there um, is that I found that there, as I said in my opening remarks, 2020 has been very difficult on many different levels. It has exposed all kinds of things, but it's also been a blessing in certain ways. And one of those ways is that it, is, it has really allowed us to stop and re, um, to, to, to reevaluate our lives and find out what's important and what's not important and take stuff off the table that's not important and and bring some things in. And it also has caused us to just be still. And one of the things that I want to talk about, or, you know, I just want to put on the the table is we are here gathered through NJPAC, which is an artistic organization. And one of the things that I know that has saved us during this time has been the arts. I mean, if you think about it, Everybody's streaming, you're looking at television, you're listening to music, you're seeing things that you would not ever have seen before. I mean, just think about, you know, I, I I'm, have performed on Broadway, I was a, a, a ballerina with Dance Theater Prom, I was all of these things. And all of a sudden now, um, the, the you have access, we all have access to, to, to the arts that we didn't have before. I mean, one of the things that Yoshi said earlier is that, you know, COVID has been the, the the great equalizer for all of us, and so I just wanted I just want to have that conversation or hear some comments from you in terms of how the arts has assisted you educationally, medically, professionally. How have you been able to use 
what we have now have access to artistically to help you in your educational fights or your or, or your you know on, on in your field of expertise. And Sister Valencia, I'm going to ask a question because you technically you are you are you are the um, one of the divine nine that will close will close us out today. Um, we are now at about two o three. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, but my question simply as, as the facilitator, but because um, uh, you have uh, in our schedule the final word, should we continue to go on uh, for X number of, because yes, this is a, a, an important- Yes, absolutely, yes, absolutely. Yes, right. And then I'm, 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 I am, even though I'm the moderator, I am going to follow and work with the flow you know, of the mind. I will say um, that I, what I also, very quickly, there was a, a, a sister, I believe by the name of, um, uh, 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 Angela was it Angela Lee, but she said micro microaggression is a matter of the heart, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I want to use that to move into also to move into what you asked asked about in turn with regard to the arts, because one of the things that I always remember is that I am a product of my mother and my father, and even though I am male, and I am a father and I'm a grandfather, what allows me to have respect to not do anything which, which would be determined as microaggression towards women is to know that when I look at that sister, I am looking at something at a part of her that exists within myself. I am 23 chromosomes, my daddy, and 23 <laughs> chromosomes, my mama, and two, two, three, and two, three, numerologically is five, and five is one cipher, right? So that means that that male and that female come together and they make one abdel, right? or one Valencia, or one Willie, or one Justin. So yes, I, I like the fact that you brought up the arts. From, from my perspective, just like like, 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 doc, like Dr. Schrake would say, everything is medicine. And Willie would say, everything is education, you know, because we all operate from the things that we are most passionate about. Right. From the center that we live in, it's all about. It it's is all, all about, about the arts. It's, it's all about the arts. That right now we are communicating through an artistic medium, even though it's two-dimensional, right? I miss the theater. I just need to say that, yeah. you know. But, um, but, yeah. imagine, but imagine that through this medium, we are able to communicate with tens and, th and hundreds of thousands of people. Willie knows what I'm talking about, right? Willie, when you go on, when you go online, you know, you get a musical artist that'll get five million hits. We could never get 5 million hits in a theater. Right? It just doesn't exist. Brother Walter's statement would never get out, you know, sometimes, you know, to more than, what, what 500,000 people, 2,000 speaking in an auditorium. But because we're online right now and using this new artistic medium, we can communicate with the world, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and it, it, it really has given us the gift of the arts and, and, and accessibility that didn't happen pre-COVID. I mean, you know, when you when you think about the fact that you have access to theater and, and, and I miss theater as well, I am devastated that, you know, we are shut down. But when you, when you think about having access to something like a Hamilton that would be cost prohibitive for, you know, some people to go see that, um, or logistically prohibitive for some people to go see that. And then, you know, you, you get on, on streaming and you can sit in your television, you know, in your living room and look at it. My, myself and my husband and my mother last night watched Ma Rainey's, which is must see. You have to see that. You absolutely have to see that. Um, but so, and so even in all this darkness, I mean, one of the things that, that we as artists do is we reflect humanity to itself. And so out of all of this darkness, there is still art being created. And I am so excited to see what happens in 2021 and 2022, because a lot of us are in our incubators right now creating stuff. And I believe that in the next two or three years, what you are going to see artistically that has been birthed in this time is just going to move us into um, new artistic heights, new, you know, new, new ways of communicating. Um, uh, and, and I'm excited about it. I'm definitely excited about I'm it. Excited. Yeah, let me say two or three quick points to your question. I think first I think about my professional life. We talk about STEM. 
uh, but we've also had a STEAM, which includes arts and science, technology, um, engineering and math. And so the arts have given us balance in the health sciences and has made our practitioners like your line sister, uh, Dr. Karma Brown Warren, uh, so much more effective because she brings an arts background to her love of science and her love of, of treating patients. I, one thing we've not talked about this, this afternoon is mental health. So what has arts meant? Arts have been a great mental health um, cure, support, I'm, I'm running out of words, but it's provided good mental health energy, especially for my kids who've been very trapped in this space. The ability to do dance, to sing and perform, um, it, it's been so great for them in that regard. And I think you're absolutely right. Art has also created an, an opportunity to create because I've had to sit still and think about the future and what I could do now that I have time. And I think art, at least in our home, has helped address the COVID fatigue that so many of us are feeling. It's also been a great tool to help uh, add creativity to what can otherwise be a stale screen, education, distance learning, uh, telecommuting world that we live in. That's what art has been for us in my household. If I could also, I just need to also make sure that we take this time to again thank uh, NJ Pack for not only providing this platform, but being uh, an advocate for the arts prior to uh, COVID. I can say, again, in the Asbury Park School District for us, uh, we were actually uh, blessed to be able to apply for and, uh, and, and receive the um, New Jersey Musicals and Schools grant um, that was taking place in Asbury Park School District. We were the first school district outside of the, uh, the immediate North Jersey area to receive that grant, and the students were able to put on a fantastic bout of some really great dramatic performances, but most importantly, um, those are things, and we let me start by saying this. It is by no coincidence that the federal government is m posing an attack on the arts education scene. Um, we know for sure this is happening. We see it and we hear it. Um, but more importantly, on the ground as educators, we feel it. And for us, I think that it's important to know that the arts play a major role. And I think that what we have to understand with this virtual space is that although it may be different for some of us, the students that we teach, they grew up in this. So for them, they are already the leaders in this space. So what we need to do is not only adjust, but accept the fact that they know more than we do here. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why a lot of the students, excuse me, the teachers and educators, principals, administrators, uh, charter education, they have an issue with figuring out, well, how do we have this conversation where we're technically behind the eight ball? The answer to that question is get in front of it. And by doing that, it, it helps us get the students that are actually in the classrooms at the table, right? We do so much to make sure that our classrooms are supported financially, but are we supporting them, you know, with the social, so, social emotional learning aspects? Again, social SEL has been a buzzword for a lot of educators for the past couple of years. But I think that if we've had this past couple of years experience dealing with SEL, we should for sure be able to make sure that our students are fulfilled and, and taught to in a way that's really appropriate. Uh, yeah, Sister Shirley, I'm, I'm, before you make your point, I'm just going to, I'm going to set, throw, throw something out to our, our listening audience who is also typing in um, points and comments on, uh, comments on the chat. If, um, as we're getting ready to wrap up before I turn it over to Valencia, is if, if anybody has a question that they want to ask anybody in the panel, please type that in and I will make sure that I read those questions. So right now, what I'm getting is a bunch of amens, right? <laughs> in, 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 in the chat, I mean, everybody is, I mean, the chat is on fire. You have, I mean, I mean, everybody's just making commentary about things that you're saying and they're impassioned and they're excited and they're giving their point of view. If there are any questions, type in a few of them. I'll get to a couple of them before I, uh, before I turn it back over to, um, um, to Sister Valencia and, and, and I can ask, ask that. Go ahead, Sister Shirley. Oh, thank you. Only that uh, we have an opportunity in our Divine Nine organizations to promote this art even more. I know right now uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha has a national initiative to provide information about the Harlem Renaissance artists because uh, so many people are not being taught that we've been writers and performers. We wrote books and poems and essays historically. So we, that's one of our projects and I know it's on everybody's mind. And then I wanna say for me personally, locked in with COVID, much as I like to be out and about, people have been saving me like uh, Miles Davis, Aretha Franklin and Fela. So I just wanted to share that. We, you, you can save yourself by listening to what you wanna to listen to. 
Yeah, there's a question that just came up. Um, um, and um, um, my, my, my dance daughter, um, um, sister Aisha, who I be, 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 be call belovedly Ooch, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, she, uh, somebody says, great conversations. How do we move into this action and which actions individually or collectively do we take first? So we can, you know, whoever wants to respond to that, you know, there's a lot of things that we have to do, a lot of responsibilities that we have to take. But, you know, how do you feel we should do this? Pick, pick something that you feel that, that, that can be done that we can accomplish. And, you know, how do we do it? You know, that somebody just asked that question. Ted, Ted you're muted. You're muted, Ted. Um, Ted, appreciate yeah. that. Thank you, Doc. Yeah, right. um, okay. I think right. the easiest thing to do, which is right there at our fingertips, is to do so much more collectively uh, mm -hmm. as, as a D9, as opposed to individually. We all are so extremely proud of our organizations. But one thing through the pandemic, and I have a friend that used to say, out of bad can come good is this reliance on not only just ourselves, but all of the totality of our village in order to come together and to have a collective purpose met. Um, I think that one, when Valencia's question in terms of what happened, what's the benefits uh, perhaps of, um, of um, the arts in all this? Well, keep it real, the arts is gonna benefit cr like crazy because of this younger generation that already uh, uses tablets and all these devices. Now, since we have to rely on that, I think they've been exposed to some things which uh, are going to reap benefits going forward. We all need to take advantage of those mediums and also our collective working together in order to, um, to make some changes, whether they're education, whether they are food or whatever. So that's an easy fix for us, just to kind of look to work a little bit more collectively than we had in the past. And, and I, I'm, I'm sorry. I've been working with, again, with through TED and the East Orange Senior Center. They've been a collective of, of us already doing that in the Northern New Jersey area. That needs to be expanded upon. And I know just personally, as a member of my alumni chapter of Cap Alpha Psi, I don't, I don't exactly know what each group in our, in our local area is doing. So I think there needs to be more sharing about what's going on with the Sigma Beta Club. And, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't know how many people know about what's going on with the Kappa League that we have and, and, you know, all the, the different uh, youth organizations that we, or youth uh, auxiliaries that we have. Um, so I think we, we need to take it upon ourselves, at least speaking for, I, I can't speak for anybody else, but we're, we're nine of us here on, on a call who can take that next step to say, all right, so how are we going to link together, at least start that conversation and we can, you know, probably make that, um, make that public here. You know, how, how do we do that? And, 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 I, and I, I take the you know, uh, we'll take the effort to, to say we can do more outreach to each other about that. I was going to say, Doc, that, you know, now is the time. I think the, the uh, Divine Nine organizations are hot. <laughs> we got one in the, in the White House, and you couldn't have a bigger platform in which people are saying, what is that? Why are they all wearing pink and green? Why are the why are the girls wearing the pearls? And you know, just walking through my suburban uh, uh, high school, you know, where I work, you know, it's like people are curious. We're in their face now, and we have to take the time to use this platform and this spotlight to do the work. And and, and meeting our young people where they are, our communities where they are, is it, the time is now. The time is right now. Uh, yeah. We 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 couldn't have a bigger spotlight than right now for, and for, for everything. Well. Because I don't, I don't know how many times I've seen an interview done from the campus of Howard talking with, uh, with the <laughs> vice president-elect. So we need to now offshoot HBCUs and offshoot, you know, the Divine yeah. Nine in this like right. large platform we have. Because right while the iron is hot. Yeah, the, Jer the, Jersey Star the Jersey Star Sigma said, since women of the Divine Nine are galvanizing toward change, what are the Divine Nine brothers doing <laughs> locally and nationally? If I could start with that really quick. So, so I think one thing, so let, let me say something very quickly, and, and I don't want to sound like sour grapes, but sometimes there's two, two comments. One is we do have a Pan-Hellenic uh, community uh, where all organizations are represented and they have chapters throughout the city of New Jersey and chapters throughout the nation. And that is a vehicle whereby we all come together to work together. So that's a very formal vehicle. I think the other great thing that happens that people don't see are the relationships that you've heard about today. Uh, uh, Ted Stevens, Justin, you know, Dr. Straker, uh, 
you know, again, Valencia calling all of us personally. Dr. Shirley Lewis and I sit on a board together. Um, you know, a, a good friend of mine, he's going to love hearing this, Brian Agnew, who's an alpha man. You know, we do work together. My good friend, Larry Crump. You know, so there's a lot of work that we are doing that sometimes we don't always market. So um, be mindful that we are out here. Um, it's, it's an imperfect science. Uh, but when you see us, encourage us, support us, join us. So when we're selling tickets to, you, well, we can't sell tickets to much anything now because of COVID. But, you know, when we're having toy drives and, and turkey drives and inviting you to, to, to buy raffle tickets from us, you know, our, our missions, our service do require money and support. And so for those of you who aren't members of our organization, when you, when you see us coming, don't run away um, because we do need your support. We are out here working for you. Yeah, and I will also say that there are about maybe 20 questions um, within the question and answer part of the chat. What, what I will, I'm just saying this to our listening audience, what I will do or what we will do is that we will um, compile these questions and give them to all of the panelists, right? And you can take a look at them and at some point um, you can answer them and we'll put together kind of like, um, you know, uh, uh, our, our report on our report, right? We'll, we'll form a, a, a document and focus a little bit more on some of these questions and we can get these out at, at some point in time um, in a future, you know, in a future um, conversation. And we'll um, do it um, in writing, virtually. If, if, I, if I could just jump in really quickly. I know, again, I know we're all chomping at the bit to have some of these really important conversations. And so yeah. I, again, I thank everybody for that. And I think that I have to say publicly with in, in front of the D9, as well as in front of our viewers that yes, although we do have the, the MPHC, we do have these, these formal bodies. Uh, I think that the Divine Nine as a collective has gotten really relaxed, uh, to be quite honest. And I think that we're in a spot now where we have to not only talk about how we're going to change the narrative, but we also have to talk about the ways that since we're, since a lot of our organizations most popularity undergraduate campuses, the undergraduate campus has changed. We need to shift the focus, talking specifically about what our graduate chapter is doing in these conversations to make sure that we can not only have the conversations on campus, but in our local and in joining communities. Um, and I also want to notice, uh, excuse me, make, make mention of the fact that we are specifically in the Iota Chi Sigma chapter, as well as the Brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha, Alpha Alpha Lambda chapter, we have started a conversation called the Interfraternal Discourse, right? Um, and what that is specifically is a, a base and a platform for the five organizations under the Divine Nine, the five or fraternities under the Divine Nine to talk specifically about some issues that we have been dealing with. As I've been saying, as the co-moderator and co-founder of the panel, that black men are being, excuse me, black men and men of color are being called back to the table to have some really important conversations about some really, really perplexing questions that we're looking to answer. So again, there are things that we're doing and I think that it's important that we continue to share each other's stuff, right? Because what ends up happening is we end up working in our own silos so much that we end up fighting within our own chapters, within our own states, that we forget that there is a bigger and broader organization to go ahead and tend to. So I think that the work is being done for sure, but I do think that speak, speaking specifically from my per perspective and what I'm doing, not only professionally, personally, and within the frat, I think it's time for us to do a little more. Yeah, and, and with my job being, being, being able to kind of correlate everything that's being said to the principles of the Nguzo Saba, Everybody as within the last five minutes has been talking about Ujima, about collective work and responsibility, about cooperative economics, about unity. So that coming together, that unity of purpose and working together is something that if we use this time of the year to jumpstart ourselves into that thinking, I think we will uh, do exactly what you're talking about, Justin, is to take a look at what our flaws and, weak and weaknesses may be you know, to, to, to have discussions about how we, do, how we correct them, to go inside ourselves and own that certain things have not been done. And what do we do collectively together, not individually, that we take our ego, our individual egos out of that and form our collective understanding and collective purpose and put it, to, and put it together. And Marvin K. White had, had asked the question, uh, you know, so are the Divine Nine are, 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 and young people today, how are traditional organizations like NAACP, an urban league and other group, groups that exist, who exists today, who is doing this work and how does the divine nine come together and use their impetus, their knowledge, their wisdom, their new, newer understandings and form a greater bond with those, in, with those in, institutions. I think that you're on it. You know, I think that you're on it. I mean, I, I, I would like to say before I bounce past to, um, to um, Valencia um, that um, you, you've, been, you've been giving the best of who you are. You, you have shared the best of who you are. 
and you were an amazing group, you know, of, 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 of black men and women um, who's obviously whose lives, no matter how old you are, and, and from the intergenerational youth of Brother Will, right, to, uh, to, um, to Mama Shirley, you know, who is, our, who is our esteemed elder, you are giving and devoting your lives, you know, to this purpose, you know, to this near, to this improvement and this faith, you know, and collective work and unity within ourselves. Um, Sister Shirley, I know it's maybe getting time to kind of wrap this up. I promise I will share these questions with the panel and we'll get them to you and then they will in turn reach out, you know, uh, in some kind of way and maybe we'll, NJPAC will produce, you know, a collective document um, which deals with some of these issues. Um, Sister Valencia, I'm passing the ball to you. Baba, first of all, thank you. We like we are literally all bowing down to you right now because thank you so much for facilitating such a wonderful, wonderful um, discussion. Um, thank you to all of my D9 brothers and sisters here. Um, I'm actually going to give each one of you a quick um, minute to shout out your your chapter, your organization, a website, anywhere where people can come and get more information on you. So I'm just gonna go across my screen. So Yoshi, do you have an, an, an email or uh, any way that people can get more information on what you're doing? I am a proud member of Alpha Alpha Chi Zeta. Um, we cover our service areas, Monmouth and Ocean County. I can put that in the chat. Um, okay. That way people have access to it. Um, and uh, hashtag is still our centennial. So Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated is excited for the work that we continue to do uh, in this centennial and beyond. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Dr. Straker, it's on you. www. Everyone, this was the opportunity to celebrate. Um, um, what can they do there? What can they do? Mute, mute. Uh, they'll see things the member of the Montclair alumni chapter, Cap Alpha Psi. We, um, uh, you could, our website is Montclair Noobs at, uh, MontclairNoobs.com, I'm sorry. And um, we do have a, a robust uh, Kappa League program. That's our leadership uh, program. Uh, we're eight, eight times, eight years in a row, uh, award-winning program in our, uh, our fraternity. Um, so we do good work with the with the youth in the community, and we um, are looking for, always looking for support and community partners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. On you. Good afternoon, and thank you, everyone, again for allowing me to participate with such an esteemed panel. Again, my name is Walter Douglas, a member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, the mighty, mighty Eta Pi chapter, <laughs> uh, founded here in Montclair, New Jersey. We are also here in the fourth corridor of the second district. I'll put all of our contact information in the chat. But one of the things that we're most proud of at the Mighty Mighty Ada Pi chapter is our earnest, earnest ever just mentoring program, uh, where we not only mentor young boys, but we also work with single moms to help them and single parents in general to help them on how to best raise their children in these very challenging times as our brother Will discussed earlier today. So thank you so much. And I'll put my information in the chat but you can also find us on Facebook, social media, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Ada Pi Chapter, Fourth Corridor, Omega Psi Phi. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Davis. And thank you again to NJ Pack for this um, productive um, conversation. Um, 30 seconds, my brother, uh, yes, 30 seconds. Yes, yes. <laughs> so you, can find, you can find us at um, Brook City Alphas on um, Instagram. I'll put all that information in the chat. I just want to real quickly uplift. Um, we have a MLK Dr. King oratorical contest on January 16th at 11 o'clock. And I'll also link that in, in the chat. Thank you again. Thank you. Mother Lewis. Yes. Thank you. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm a member of Omicron Xi Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. We are located in Montclair, New Jersey and the varying areas committed to service for everyone. I will put our uh, contact address We're on, available on email online, but I'll put it in the chat. And thank you so much for this opportunity. And I love the opportunity of getting together with the Divine Nine. Thank you. We were honored to have you. Thank you. And Sister Hassel, you're on. 
Hello, uh, I am not, uh, um, I know I'm going to get a lot of uh, feedback. I am not currently active in chap local chapter. Uh, I am associating with the University of Pittsburgh, but I do want to encourage you all to promote your students to advocate for themselves and reach out. I will put um, my contact information. I'm more than happy to share about um, as college search and information there. Thank you. Important, important information. Thank you. Brother Artisant, did I say that right? Artinet, Artinet. Artinet, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Listen, that's the, probably the best way that it's been pronounced in a while, so I appreciate it. Uh, again, uh, Justin Artinet, member of, proud member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, of first vice president of the Iota Chi Sigma chapter, and I'm also the education director for our st great state of New Jersey in the mighty Eastern region. Um, again, I'll be post posting our Facebook um, information as well. That's where we are most active and uh, we're looking to continue in, to engage and we've begun to use this virtual platform much more readily. So we look forward to connecting with you there. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Brother Stevens. Thank you, Sister Valencia, I appreciate it. Uh, let me just thank everybody for allowing us to, to come together. I think it was fantastic. Um, for food insecurities, um, the um, benefactor in this area has been the Interfaith Food Pantry of the Oranges, and they're at www.ifpo.org. You can put information in there and, and in, indicate if there are any food insecurities not being met. You can check the City of East Orange's website as well for senior services, and you can get that information. Or, of course, you can check with the Atlantic Coast region for Iota Phi Theta. Let me just end quickly with one thing, and I just prepared it for this. I have a little special uh, pan hell wrap that I put together and I want to end with. You can talk about the arts. This is my contribution, I hope, to the arts. I love it. <laughs> I'm TED in the place to be. I odify Theta born in 63. Kwanzaa 2020, we do easily with our friends at NJPAC. I owe this dance and step singing oh so fine, but we're stronger as part of the divine nine. As for me, I prosecute some serious cases seeking justice for black, brown, and white faces. And as I end this rap, I offer this refrain, wear your mask, wash your hands, and let Kwanzaa reign. <laughs> Stevens out. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Well, look, I, okay, I, I didn't even say give my information. I am a part of the North Jersey chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. You can find us at NorthJerseyDeltas.org um, to learn about all of our, um, our programs that we are utilizing to serve the community. And I just want to say to our um, guest today. Um, thank you. We hope that this conversation has informed you, it has encouraged you, it has convicted you in some way, and most of all, it has inspired you. So again, we ask you to do your, dilig your due diligence and research our organizations, and um, as Brother um, Douglas said earlier, when we come knocking, please open those doors because mm -hmm we are moving forward with the charge that you have given us and that is to work collectively. And so we cannot do that without your support. Thank you again to NJ Pack, to Aisha and Donna and everybody involved um, with putting this together. I am so humbled that you thought it not robbery to put this in my hands. And so I, I am so very thankful for this. We thank you so much Valencia Yearwood. Can we? Uh, community celebrate Baba Abdel Salam and our sister, our Delta sister, Valencia Yearwood. We celebrate you. We want to invite you all to attend more of Kwanzaa. This is just the beginning. Right. We had the most amazing Elder Story conversation at 1130 today. So please look at the pre-recorded uh, programming. You will not 
be disappointed. We also have another program coming up right now, immediately afterwards with our theater director. So stand by, go back online, njpack.org backslash Kwanzaa and register for the conversation with our Theater Alliance. Won't we celebrate today? Can we give another snap up for the Divine Nine? You are amazing. And you obviously exemplify how Divine Nine embodies the seven principles of the Nguzo Saba. Thank you for stopping by again today and continue to stay together, a family that stays together. We work together, we can make things happen. I celebrate you. Happy Kwanzaa, pre-Kwanzaa, stay in touch and please go shopping. We have some artisans that need your support. As soon as you can, visit our website. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Bye for now.